what I felt it was time to do was to try and speak for a few moments about the ineffable. Of course, one can't speak of the ineffable. The only way one can speak of the ineffable is by poetry or by metaphor. Or by somehow trying to signify a sort of direct experience. It's important to allow the awareness to be filled by the quality of this silence. And you will notice if you can allow that to happen. But this kind of silence seems to have all sorts of properties, which are really not the properties of the room, which is unchanging, but due to the movement of the self-quietening mind. As many of you know, I love fire ceremonies. So when Simon sent the email that he was making a video of a few of us um, in remembrance of Man Fluid, the only thing I could do was a fire ceremony. We've had lots at Man Fluid. Over the years, there've been wet ones, there've been hot ones, there have been thundery ones, there have been some awfully midgy ones, but they are always all a very moving experience because the fire ceremony taps into a deep part of our psyche, both from a serious point of view and from a fun point of view. So fire ceremonies are huge fun but it also gives us an opportunity to get in touch with something that is deeper within us. Thank you. So now we will light the fire. Oh, 
sere om my love for the mind fluid very much intertwined with my love for John as a kind friend, a marvellous teacher and in some ways a father figure to me. It's fitting that his ashes were scattered to the wind on the hill above the mine clue, so in some way John was absorbed into the hills and the valley that surrounds the house. John always enthused about the magic of that place and I always feel a tingle of that magic as I pass into the valley of Pantidua. I feel the mind clothes very much for me a place of ever, ever changing weather. My first visit as a third year student going there with John for a weekend field trip was a torrential monsoon rain where the whole landscape became a myriad of overflowing streams. My first retreat in 1982, the snow covered the hedgerows and the temperature dropped below minus 15. And there have been other times with full moon, frosty, frosty evenings. And then there's the verdant summer with the green grass and the birds singing and the sheep bearing. And then always there's, of course, there's the rain and the mud and more mud and more rain. And then there are the rainbows. Life always changes. Weather always changes. I'm very grateful for my time at the Mind Fluid. I spent a lot of time cooking at the Mind Club, particularly in the 90s when I was spending up to eight weeks a year cooking, where my home in, became a second home for me at the Mind Club, particularly in the kitchen with the Rayburn, which I had to keep stoking like a steam train to bake bread and bake cakes, and sitting in the Buddha room and then the Zendo, which is, became the refectory, and eventually the Chan Hall. Sort of fluctuation between cooking and sitting, cooking and sitting. And it wasn't until I went back in 2004, which was four years since I last cooked, when I sat a retreat, a calm retreat, and I realised the great gratitude I'd had for that place. I was filled with tears of joy of refining and tears of grief for having lost it for so long. And I realised that my whole life was written across that landscape. Relationships came coming and going, my father dying, and all the insights that I'd had and all the struggles that I'd had were there on the landscape. So it felt as if my life was painted across the hills and the valleys. And the special, I then realised the special thing about the mind fluid is that so many people have gone there and worked so hard with their koans. And the walls of the Chan Hall, and particularly the house, are absorbed with all of that energy. Both the pain and the anger, and the tears and the joy, and the deep insights. And in that way, the magic that John spoke of has been layer upon layer laid into the place, the valley, the house, the Chan Hall, the mud in the yard. And that is what I respect. So I'm going to finish my little talk with what really inspired me when I actually went on that first retreat and made me come back time and time, time again. And these words are definitely written for that place. No guru, no church, no dependency. Beyond the farmyard, the wind in the trees, the fall, by the signless signpost stands pointing out the way. Here on the mountain, where the path stops, you go on into the snow alone. And that, for me, very much describes my love of the mind fluid, that place, going on, going on beyond, going beyond beyond, going completely. Thank you. As I thought about my memories of Mind Cloyd, what always arises for me is the changes that have occurred. 
those that I've seen and those that I've made a contribution to. One of the first jobs I had was to paint some wooden flower boxes which stood on the front windowsill. Over time, the paint faded, the wood disintegrated, and then the boxes were gone. I remember laying a gravel floor in the woodshed, taking stone from on the side of the hill. Again, as time moved, the gravel became part of the archaeology of the place, and a new floor emerged. I remember running up the hill and how that changed to exercises in the yard. I remember moving from sitting in the Buddha room to sitting in the barn and then moving into the new Zendo. And however much I appreciated being in that new space, there was always a bit of my memory telling me that it was still a barn with a chemical toilet in the middle, an image which I could never displace. A change that I was sorry to see was the loss of the signless signpost, the original one that stood at the gate. Because without that telling us where to be, where were we foals supposed to stand? The image of the signless signpost comes from John's writings and leads me to my appreciation of being in the exact place where John wrote those poems and words which are now part of our liturgy. Words that reflect the natural splendour of the place and the natural splendour of practice itself. Ordinary grey rocks of the mountain, ever-moving clouds and overarching sky, subtle valleys and valleys of suffering. Mount Lloyd is a place where we learned to recognise and confront the changes within ourselves. It is a place where we truly learned to appreciate the silence of nature. And I have no doubt that we will take that learning forward. Tolalukshi 这个道场位在威尔斯南部
每天用完早餐后是劳动时间，在这里，无论是大学教授或是心理医师，都是一样的。有的人准备下一餐的饮食，有的打扫清洁，有的铺路，有的清理垃圾。每个人都有自己的工作岗位，秩序井然而有条理。当然，没有一个人会呼朋引伴，更没有一个人开口说话。斯禅堂是约翰·克鲁克先生自1965年开始逐步购买，直到两年前，九十多岁的母亲过世后，遗留给他一些金钱，才让他如愿盖好了禅堂。趁着师傅到来，约翰特别敦请师傅主持了简单而隆重的启用仪式。人的心中都充满了华喜，荡漾在他们脸上的笑容是那么的幸福。40 years ago, in summer 1980, I booked to attend the Western Zen Retreat at Mount Cluid. It was cancelled due to low bookings, but I rebooked and attended my first Western Zen Retreat in January 81. Uh, life with so many of you. I still very clearly remember that first retreat. I remember the、uh, dark, stormy night driving there. Eventually, driving up a track, seemingly into nowhere, as the track disappeared up the hillside, but eventually arriving in a dark farmyard with just the merest hint of yellow light、uh, at a window. Opening the door and saying, "Have I found the right place?" A hubbub of people, strangers chatting, 
and uh, in a strange room with strange objects, skulls, snowshoes, a strange encounter. Finding my bed place up a ladder in the attic of the house, sleeping bag on a canvas camp bed. And the retreat itself, the, which was something completely new to me. The communication exercises, the painful sitting cross-legged meditation, which I relieved by making myself a wooden bench quickly during a work period from an old plank that was destined to be firewood. And ultimately, the sudden clarity of finding myself an important and critical moment. That's those circumstances, that event seared itself into my mind and my included became part of me. Like, uh, again, like so many of you, I returned again and again. My included has this quality of uh, feeling at home emotionally, which draws us back. I can't tell you how many retreats I've attended. They've become rather blurred over the years. But a rough uh, calculation of my frequency of retreats and the length of time I've been doing them and such like, I've probably spent around about 900 nights sleeping at my included, about two and a half years of my life. This includes sitting retreats as participants, or leading retreats, training others to lead retreats, and other events such as WCF committee meetings. I even uh, hired my include from John for family holidays on a couple of occasions. So really, my include is part of me, or I'm part of it. We've been inseparable over the years. Another factor with my include was that is where I first met Master Sheng Yen. Uh, John specifically invited me to attend the uh, second retreat that Master Sheng Yen came to lead at my include, and that's where I first met Shifu. And it was during that retreat in 1992 that he gave me Inca, his confirmation of my experience, and subsequently in 2000, giving me transmission to be his. Uh, second Dharma heir following John, second lay Dharma heir that was also the monastic uh, Chicha and Fasha before John. So, so many connections with my included over so many years. My uh, role there nowadays is more in the role of teacher than participant, and taking the role of the fool who tries to point out the way using a signless signpost. But my included lends itself to both teaching and practicing. The isolation, the separation from our everyday lives makes it easy to be present. The quirkiness of the property and the beauty of the landscape keeps us, keeps our attention there, again making it possible to be present. And in these ways we are blending more and more with the place and the landscape, and uh, just feeling part of it. It was a great thing that John did, setting up my included, and I feel so much gratitude to him for the work he's done, and for creating and sharing that place with us. And it's absolutely fitting that we meet today to celebrate my included. I first went to Mind Cluid in 1995 and it was autumn, October, and I arrived in the dark. Uh, I'd picked up another retreatant on the way and uh, neither of us knew where we were going, neither of us had done a retreat before, and so we were completely in the dark. And so it was when we arrived, we were indeed completely in the dark in that black night and uh, just a few bits of cracks of light shining out from those tiny little windows in the churn hall and in the uh, sitting room. And John arrived in the yard to show us where to park. And interestingly, I knew it was him, even though he didn't introduce himself. And uh, I'd never seen him before. Uh, that might sound a bit mystical, but it was just the way it was. Uh, 
And I fell in love with the place virtually as soon as I set foot in there. I liked the candlelight. I liked the paraffin lamps. I liked everything about it. I went and blew up my lilo because that was what you had to do in those days. We didn't have the futons then. Uh, put my sleeping bag down and embarked on my first Chan adventure. Um, there are lots of things I think about when I think of my included. I think of the red kites. I think of the view down the valley. I think of those mornings when the mist is in the valley below you and you're above it. And you're reminded of the cloud of unknowing and dropping all thoughts of whatever you think is into the cloud of forgetting and just seeing what else there might be. I remember particularly the sounds of the buzzards and the sounds of the red kites and really all the wildlife there. The uh, most interesting uh, interlude with the wildlife uh, that I ever had was running an interview in the library and a polecat peering down from the rafters above me where it had been nesting and you could hear the kits squeaking up there. Uh, fortunately, the person who was uh, being interviewed didn't mind at all. We did all kinds of things to uh, try and stop this polecat, but it was well established. And whoever it was that was sleeping in the library had to kind of clear bits of insulation from there floor every day because the polecat had been disrupting it and presumably making bedding for itself. So there were lots of beautiful things, uh, lots of scenery, lots of animal life, lots of nature. Uh, and all of that I remember with great fondness. But I suppose the biggest thing that I remember about my included is the transformation that goes on there and that has gone on there over the years. And interestingly, I found that you could still do that in other places too, but my included will always hold a particularly special place in my heart. The first retreat that I went on in the Mines Lloyd was in 1982. We arrived on a cold, wet, dark January evening, and when we got there, there were no lights on in the house. So another look at the joining instructions and it became clear the retreat didn't start on a Tuesday, the night we were there, but started on a Thursday. we come a long way, uh, certainly didn't want to go back home. And there's always a key. So a fairly quick search and the key was found in its secret hiding place and we entered the house. Next morning, what was re revealed was a very dusty place. Um, old fashioned mismatched furniture, threadbare carpet, dark dingy kitchen, but anyway, after a bit of work, you know, sweeping the place out and uh, muttering to myself about who would dream of leaving a place in this state, all was set for John's arrival in the afternoon. He was not slow to show his displeasure at uh, the fact that his place had been invaded, but at least reassured that there had been no breakages. style of retreat that was done at the Mindclued initially was the Western Zen Retreat and that was an invention of John's and what he was testing really was whether the teachings or the inspiration if you like of the Buddha could be verified in a modern Western context. It's not necessary to learn a great deal of theory, it's not necessary to be a monk for all of one's life and the retreats were set up in a way which strongly created a direct encounter. The encounter of course is with oneself. So it was a unique experiment. Nobody had ever actually tried it this way before. That first retreat had a, quite a significant effect on, on my life. I was becoming a therapist and, uh, and I was trying to make a name for myself. And it, the great joke was the sudden realization that I already had a name. And that, uh, that insight has actually shaped my whole life. It took away something about trying to be different from what I am. Um, so it's very, very helpful. So from this beginning of the retreat, when everything was quite, seemed quite sort of dark and miserable, by the end of the retreat, there was a transformation. It felt to me, at least to my eyes, that uh, what had been a small dark house had become a kind of Aladdin's cave. 
and outside it was surrounded by snow. And so uh, in the sunlight, this house was shining. Codependent origination in action. Of course, it had also been in action at the beginning of the retreat. Uh, what we see depends upon the state of our mind. And here is a photograph of us just about uh, getting ready to leave. If you look in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the snowshoes. Um, these were essential for walking down the lane because the snow had drifted, had a pile right to the top of the lanes. The only problem was there was only one pair of snowshoes. And guess who wore those? John, of course. And if you look into the centre of the picture, you will see uh, Simon in the back. There he is, with a good head of hair and a black beard. The opening words for every retreat are no guru, no church, no dependency. And yes, and so perhaps in some ways we were somewhat dependent both on John and on the place. Gradually, the mind fluid itself became somewhat less central. It had become, if you like, the seed from which something else had germinated, something wider, something more um, significant, I think, and something which probably goes beyond the, the particular individuals and a place. In fact, it's essential to understanding the Dharma. The Dharma is not confined to anywhere. So now, after many people have attended retreats at the Mind Floyd, and in many cases with life-changing consequences, our retreats there are over. The walls that have heard so much are now quiet. The house sits silent below the split pine on the hill. The grass will have grown long, and I imagine the mice will have free reign. The stream burbles along as it always has done. And high above the house is the solitary tree under which John Crook's ashes were scattered. Impermanence in action. The teachings of the Buddha have been verified. John's experiment has been fulfilled. But the inspiration behind it continues to evolve.